Meet our friend Placidus. He is a 10 year old boy who was born with one leg that bowed outwards. His leg made it painful to walk and almost impossible to run. On top of it all, the other kids at his school would make fun of him for the way he looked. Thankfully, he found the Cure Children's Hospital of Zambia where he received surgery to straighten his leg. After time to heal and physical therapy, Placidus is not only standing on two straight legs, but also running with confidence and joy. What a great story. What a beautiful picture of the opportunity that we have, the impact that, that we are trying to make as a church. If you've been uh, tracking with us, we mentioned it earlier in the service, but uh, this summer through the end of this month of July, we've been telling the story of CURE, this, this organization that is doing such great work in Zambia and following the lead of our kids. And our goal as a church is to raise $150,000 to send to them, which would pay for a surgeon and, and all the materials that that person would need to change not just one child's life, but hundreds of them uh, to give new hope and new life and new joy that we just heard about. And so we've been talking about this. We're about a third of our way to our goal. And one of the things that we talk about as a church a lot, we use this language that, that we believe generosity is an act of worship. We say that, and what we mean when we say that is that when you give, it is not just the person that you give towards that is blessed. We know that will happen. We know that, that this gift is gonna change lives and we're so grateful that we have this opportunity. But what we mean by this act of worship is that when you give, something happens for you as well. That it is in giving that God changes our hearts and transforms our lives and reminds us that we can depend on him for provision. That we're reminded that God is calling us to be a part of the work that he is doing all over the world. And so today, if, if giving is not part of one of the ways that you worship, I just want to invite you to consider today how you might be a part of this project. How God might use your generosity, not just for others, but for yourself. We really do believe this, that, that even a couple of dollars, even a, the price of a cup of coffee or, or something much greater, whatever it is, is going to change lives and it will change you as well. And so today, consider how it is that you might give. You can find more information on our website. You can scan the QR code in the seat back in front of you. And, and again, thank you so much for your generosity and for being part of this great thing that God has called us to. Let's pray as we open up God's word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your wisdom that we seek now. Lord, thank you for the reminder of what we just sang, that you are the great I am, that you are holy, that you are mighty, that you are faithful to each one of us. And so we ask that you would speak to each one of us, that your wisdom would come down onto our lives. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. Uh, recently, I found myself uh, thinking back to the day that my wife and I brought our son, Luca, home for the very first time. It was a day that we had been looking forward to for a while. He spent quite a, a bit of time in the NICU. And so it was one of those things, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Uh, have you ever experienced longing for something and hoping for something and waiting for something to arrive? And then when it does arrive, you have no idea what to do next. Uh, maybe parents, you know that feeling. And, and I just remember that day just being overwhelmed with uncertainty and, and having all of these questions and just thinking like, like, are they really gonna trust me to take care of this human being? Like, shouldn't there be a test I have to pass or a manual or a survival guide or something? And, and I remember talking about this with one of the nurses there and, and I went to her and I said, like, 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 what do I do? Like, what now? And she looked at me and she said, you just enjoy the journey. And I said, that's not helpful at all. <laughs> like, I need to have a book. Is there a podcast? Like something, I, I need some wisdom. And today, as we continue in our pursuit of wisdom, we're studying this book of Proverbs and what we see in it is the closest thing that we can find to that, to a manual, a survival guide what it looks like to live well, to live wisely in the world that God has made. We spent the last several weeks asking ourselves about what wisdom is and the way it's found. Last week, if you were here, Pastor Sterling showed us this contrast that we see throughout the book of Proverbs between wisdom and foolishness. And he showed us this, that, that to be wise in God's eyes comes when we 
rely on his design and receive his correction and trust in his ways and not our own. And this marks kind of a shift in our series where from here until the rest of the summer, what we're going to be doing, rather than taking this whole book one uh, chapter or one section at a time, what we're gonna be doing is taking all of Proverbs and we're gonna apply it as best we can to different parts of life. We're gonna ask ourselves, what does it mean for me to be wise with my money? What does it look like to work wisely? What does it look like to have wise friendships? And today, the thing that I needed most that day in the hospital, what it means to be wise with our families. What does a wise family look like? What does it look like for you and for me, whatever your family is and whatever your role in it? What does it mean for us as spouses, parents, grandparents, children, siblings, how can we grow in the wisdom of God? What does it look like for those of us that grew up in wise families to grow wiser together? What does it look like for those of us that grew up in homes that maybe experienced some foolishness? For God to heal that and redeem it and transform it. How can my family be more wise? Here's what we're going to see today. Solomon giving us four wisdom principles. I'm gonna give you all four right up front in case I lose you along the way. Here are the four principles. Number one, uh, wise families seek wisdom. Number two, wise parents share wisdom. Three, wise children receive wisdom. And then four, wise marriages show wisdom. So wise families seek it, wise parents share it, wise children receive it, and wise marriages show it. Let's jump in today and we'll start with God's wisdom for families. His wisdom for families. This is uh, Proverbs chapter 24, verse three. It says, by wisdom, a house is built and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. In chapter 14, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. This is Solomon's first lesson when it comes to families. Notice what we see here. Notice the contrast that Solomon is making. Notice the distinction that he shows us between the house of one that is wise and the house of one that is proud or wicked or foolish. And what he's telling us is that it is only the house of the wise that will flourish and thrive. And those that are proud will fall. Solomon uh, puts it this way in Psalm 127. In verse one, he says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. This is the foundation, the thing that every wise family does. They build their house on the wisdom and the word of God. Back when I was uh, in school, probably fifth grade or or somewhere around that range, I remember uh, being given an assignment to build a bridge out of toothpicks and glue. Anybody else do that project in school? Uh, If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, that's uh, kind of the idea. This is what it's supposed to look like. I assure you, mine did not look that cool. Uh, That's very impressive. Uh, Last time I was here, I told you guys that I am not a handy person, uh, and that applies to toothpick bridges as well, apparently. Uh, I spent weeks working on this thing and spent so much time just pouring myself into it, and I took that thing into school, and, and our teacher put weights to see who would win, and the very first weight that my teacher put on, my thing just crumbled. And I said, guess I won't be an engineer. Maybe I should be a pastor. And here I am. (laughs) But this is what Solomon is teaching here, that, that this is what wise families do. They choose carefully the builder, the materials, and the foundation for their homes. They build their homes wisely. They build it on the wisdom and the word of God. This is Deuteronomy chapter six. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." 
If you're uh, new to the Old Testament, maybe it's been a while since you've studied Deuteronomy. What's happening here is Moses is speaking to the Israelites shortly before his death. This is kind of a a farewell address to to the people. And what he's doing is re-emphasizing and reminding them of the authority and the importance of God's word in their lives. And what he's doing is calling them and saying, please do this, build your lives wisely, build it on the word of God. Put it everywhere that you can think of. Put it on your homes. Put it on your hands. Put it on your gates. And and this is the point that I want you to see today. That the greatest gift that you can give to your family is to build your life according to God's wisdom that is revealed in his word. Look again with me to verses uh, six and seven. We see this, that, that we are to diligently teach them to our children. We'll talk about that in a minute, but what are we supposed to do before that? That we are to let the word of God transform and change our hearts, that it is to fundamentally change how we live our lives. If you want your family to be wise, then this is what you do. You pursue the wisdom of God each and every day. You put it everywhere that you can think. Solomon uh, talks about this. There's a great proverb in uh, Proverbs 20, verse seven. It says that the righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. If you want your house to be filled with wisdom, this is where you start. You pursue the righteousness of and integrity of God, you walk in the way of Jesus. Several years ago, uh, I remember uh, talking to my dad and and him telling me uh, that he had decided to reach out to a former coworker of his who years ago had mistreated him to the point that their relationship had come to an end. And he told me this, and he told me that, that he decided that he needed to do this, and he needed to forgive this person, and he decided that he needed to make things right. And I remember this so clearly because uh, the Scavados come from a long line of grudge holders. Like, that is kind of who we are as a family. My dad was half Irish and half Italian, uh, and so it's kind of just like baked into his DNA. It was like half that and half like Alfredo sauce. That was kind of the, the mixture. Um, And like, it was to the point where I was resentful on my dad's behalf. Like I was gonna raise my children to stand against his. Like that's how Italians do things. (laughs) And yet my dad knew the wisdom of God. He knew that for a follower of Jesus, forgiveness is not an option. It's a command. That he was to forgive because he had been forgiven. And so that's what he did. I've been a Christian since I was a kid. I can tell you exactly where in the Bible it tells us to forgive others. It is hard to describe to you today the impact that seeing my dad do that had on my life. It's hard to describe the weight that that carried of seeing him not just know it, but live it. Seeing him build his life and walk in the way of wisdom. Parents, grandparents, spouses, children, whatever your role is in your family, this is the greatest gift that you can give to them. You build your life. You walk. You seek out the wisdom that is revealed in his word. The biggest blessing that you can offer them is not to make them first, it is to make Jesus first. It's good to provide to protect, to teach, to honor. We're gonna talk about all of that stuff. But there is nothing better that you can do and no better legacy that you can leave and there is nothing that will make a bigger impact on those that you love so much than devoting yourself to a walk with Christ. Relentlessly pursuing and building your life on his wisdom and not your own. Wise families seek wisdom Here's the next thing we'll look at today, God's wisdom for parents and for children, for parents and for children. I've uh, shared this story before with you, I'm I'm sure. Uh, I remember the the time that my wife told me that I was going to be a parent. 
Uh, we were with our, our life group for some reason. We came separately. I think I was coming from work or something like that. And um, I remember uh, when I got there, she came up to me and she had kind of a strange look on her face. And she asked me if I could walk with her to her car to put her coat away. And I believe my exact words were, that is not a two-person job. <laughs> she is lucky to have me. <laughs> Eventually, though, she, she talked me into the heroic sacrifice of walking 100 feet. Um, and I remember she told me, and immediately, as soon as I found out, having all these emotions come to me, this feeling of excitement and joy and also fear and, and questions and not knowing what to do, and that was over two years ago, and none of those things have gone away. It's still really great. It's still really hard. This relationship matters, and thankfully, Proverbs is filled with wisdom for what it means to be wise parents and what it means to be wise children. Look with me to Proverbs chapter one. Uh, this is in verse eight. It says, hear my son, your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Here are our next two wisdom principles that wise children receive wisdom and wise parents share it. We've looked at this already quite a bit in the series, this wisdom for children, how over and over, this is Solomon's call to his own son, his own children, to receive the words that he has for them. Children are to receive wisdom, to listen, to obey, to respect, to bring joy. The biblical term for this is called honor. Kids, students here with us today, this is God's desire for you that you would honor your parents, that you would be open to their wisdom, that you would obey them up until the point that it would lead to disobedience to God. Do not take them for granted. God has chosen them for you. Those of us who are no longer kids, honoring our parents is not something that we are exempt from. It's something we are all called to throughout our lives. And, and as adults, the primary way that we can honor our parents is through respect. Respect your parents, even if they did not give you a perfect childhood. Forgive them if there is something that needs to be forgiven. Care for them, treat them with dignity, honor them, even if they are no longer with us. Children, honor your parents, receive wisdom. Then it's parents, love your kids by sharing wisdom. And scripture is filled with wisdom for parents. Let me just give you three uh, things that scripture describes, three tools for raising wise children. You offer diligent instruction, you give loving discipline, and you express your delight. We see this first one back in uh, Deuteronomy chapter six, this uh, diligent instruction. It says uh, this in verse seven, that you shall teach them diligently to your children. Shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, parents, this is the way that you are to instruct your kids. You do it every day and everywhere and in every way that you can think. Wisdom is rarely found once a week on Sunday mornings for an hour. It is a daily rhythm, a muscle to develop. We are to be diligent in teaching our kids about the wisdom of God. One of the things I'm grateful for as a parent about this church is that our, our student ministry teams and our kids ministry teams do not think that it is their job to disciple our kids on their own. You'll hear this language for them that they uh, wanna partner with families and partner with parents and that the, the, the home and not the church is the primary discipleship opportunity. Think about it this way. If, if I bring my son every week to this church, and I do, that's 52 hours a year that he is here out of over 8,000 hours in the year. That's less than 1% of his life. How many of us in a world that is filled with different messages about God and about good and with competing values, how many of us think that that could ever be enough? 
See, this is what wise parents recognize, that to be a wise parent is to be diligent. If I want my kids to know and trust the Lord that there are daily opportunities that I must take advantage of. Wise parents aren't afraid of big questions or hard conversations. Wise parents are okay with doubt. Wise parents respond to sin the way Jesus does, with grace and with truth. All of this is what it means to instruct our kids in the way of the Lord. We are to ground them in the wisdom of God. Wise parents offer instruction. That's the first way. Here's the second one, that wise parents give loving discipline. This, again, is something that Solomon addresses over and over throughout this book. I'll show you just one verse in chapter 13. It says this, that whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Let's pause here, shall we? I know for some of us, we didn't make it past the first line of that verse, did we? This idea of sparing the rod oftentimes is a controversial one, oftentimes used in discussions about the form of punishment, the way in which we as parents discipline our kids. But what Solomon is doing, at least in this verse, is something more than that. He's speaking not just to the form, but to the purpose, the reason that discipline matters. Look with me to Psalm chapter 23. It says this in verse 4, that Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If you're familiar with this psalm, you know that this is David uh, describing God as his shepherd, the one who leads him to still waters, the one who restores his soul, and also what we see here, the one who uses a rod and a staff, not to bring affliction, but to bring comfort. Now, the rod was this uh, kind of short wooden stick, kind of like a club that was used, and it was the tool of a shepherd, and it was used primarily for three things. It was used to count, to show authority and belonging, to guide, to keep them on the right path, and to protect, to use as a weapon on any that might try to devour them. So this is the picture that we're given of what it means to discipline wisely. That discipline is not about instilling fear, not about inflicting pain, not about releasing anger. Discipline is about being a good shepherd. It is about authority, guidance, and protection. The author of Hebrews describes it as an act of love. Look with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. This is Proverbs 3, by the way, that the author is quoting. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Wise parents recognize that it is not loving to let our kids walk down a path of foolishness while we offer nothing but affirmation. Wise parents also recognize that it is not loving to use discipline as a cover for abuse. Discipline takes on different forms for every child and in every stage. And it is the wise parent who recognizes that and does it all in love to guide them to protect them, to bring them back to the path of life. And then third, wise parents delight in their children. I love this uh, proverb back in uh, chapter 23. It says, my son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. My inmost being will exult when your lips speak what is right. Parents, no matter how old your kids are, grandparents, Aunts, uncles, if you work or volunteer with kids, this is one of the most important things you can do and one of the greatest ways to make those kids wise. You make it as clear as possible that you and their heavenly father delight in who they are. Tell them specifically what you love about them. 
Tell them why they mean so much to you. Most importantly, tell them the ways that you see God working in their lives. Be unreasonably proud when they take a step of faith. Give thanks to God when they walk in wisdom. Follow the example of God himself who, seeing his son get baptized, declares this in this moment of fatherly love and joy that this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Wise children, come with diligent instruction, loving discipline, and utter delight. We'll close with this, God's wisdom for marriage. His wisdom for marriage. So we've seen this, that wise families seek wisdom, wise children receive it, wise parents share it. And here's the last thing that we'll see today, that wise marriages show wisdom. Wise marriages show wisdom. Look with me to Proverbs 18. We see this in verse uh, 22. It says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. House and wealth are inherited from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. So this is the way that Solomon views marriage. He sees it as a gift that comes directly from God that is designed to show his wisdom. Think back for a moment, if you can, to the uh, series we did earlier this year in the book of Genesis. Do you remember that? We, we talked about this, how God uh, in this outpouring of love creates everything, the heavens and the earth. And he says that everything is good except one thing. Do you remember what it was? We saw this back in Genesis chapter two in verse 18. It says, that the Lord God said that it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. That helper word is uh, uh, ally, strength, partner. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. See, this is why Solomon describes marriage as a gift because God created it It was his design and it was was his idea to bring more goodness into the world. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter five. He's talking about his instructions for wise homes and he mentions this. He actually quotes the verse that we just read. He says this, that therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, that each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Marriage is a gift. He who finds a good wife finds a good thing. She who finds a good husband does the same. Why? Because marriage is a picture and the embodiment and the expression of the gospel. It is the mystery, it is the wisdom of God revealed to us. Timothy Keller puts it this way, that marriage is gospel reenactment. And this is what wise spouses realize, that if today that you are married, you have entered into a covenant. You have made a promise to that person, a promise marked by faithfulness and patience and encouragement and love, but that you do not do those things simply because it is the right thing to do. And you do not do those things in expectation that the other will return the favor. Sometimes we miss this, I think, and and so many people view marriage and, and, and see it as a contract. And see it as, as long as you do this for me, then I will return the favor. That marriage becomes kind of about ourselves and our own self-fulfillment and what I can get out of it. And, And God says, no, this is a covenant. This is a promise. This is something that I will do no matter what. Why? Because this is what Jesus has already done for me. In marriage, we are to be faithful to our spouse because Jesus has been faithful to us. We are to be patient, to endure, to not give up in difficult seasons because God has never given up on you. We are to love sacrificially, to lay our lives down because he first loved us. This is what 
wise marriages do. They declare this, that contrary to the wisdom of the world, it is better to give than receive and serve than be served, and I will empty myself knowing that someone has already done that perfectly for me. Wise families recognize that family is a gift given from God for the gospel to be made known. Let me close with this. Um, Because I know that that for some of you here today, I know you heard that. This idea that marriage is a gift or that family is a gift. And for some of us, maybe you disagree. Maybe for you, family is not something that has pointed you to the gospel. Maybe when you think of family, you think of hurt or rejection or estrangement. The truth is, just like anything, these things that were meant to be gifts can often be the, the source of our greatest pain. For some of us, we think of something that we have always wanted and that we never found. For something that we used to have and that we no longer do. For some of us, the source of our greatest pain and that we're still carrying with us today. And so if that's you today, I just wanna share a few things with you. First, I just wanna say if something did happen that shouldn't have happened, I'm deeply sorry that I did. One of the things I love about scripture and I love about our God is that he is not a God that demands immediate recovery from our pain. He is utterly comfortable sitting with you in your tears and your hurt and your questions. I have a reminder that no matter what things are like with your own family, that the church exists to be God's family. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter two. He's writing and he says that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and that you are members of the household of God. We use this language a lot here at Chapel Street that we are a church family. We wanna be a a church family. I hope you know that that applies to you, that these are your brothers and your sisters, that you are a son or a daughter of God and that scripture says that you are not just a child, but an heir and a co-heir with Christ. You matter to him and you belong here. I have an encouragement that today can be the day and that you can be the one in your family to break whatever that pattern is. That it is not too late and there is no family too broken and that person that you love so much that seems so lost is not outside of the reach and the power of God that his desire is that none would perish and that all would come to repentance. And then last, I have hope. I have hope that when our earthly families fail us, that we can be reminded of a perfect, never-changing, holy and righteous, heavenly father. Of a son who died with you and I in mind. And that if we put our faith in Jesus, we have a promise of total belonging and complete acceptance and an eternal, perfect relationship. We have something that not even the best earthly family here can offer us. We have hope that cannot be broken. This is our future that we have to look forward to. A forever family filled with the love and the wisdom of God. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we do come to you grateful. Grateful for your wisdom and grateful for your love. I pray now for those that are hurting from their families, those seeking wisdom with their children or with their parents or whatever it may be. Lord, we know that you are the source of wisdom, that you are wisdom. And so we seek you in everything that we do. Lord, remind us, guide us, be with us now. We ask all this in your name, amen. Amen, how good it is to sing of his goodness for us. Uh, As always, if, if there's something going on in your life, our prayer team is ready in the glass room right outside in the lobby. We're honored to do that. It's our privilege to come alongside you in prayer. For those of you that came prepared to give, we have boxes in the back and give online as well. We're so grateful for those of you that worship through your generosity. Receive now today's benediction.
Would you go in the love of a perfect father, in the hope of Christ the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit, a beloved member of God's family filled with his wisdom. Amen.